Okay, so so we're just going to do valence bond theory. We'll we'll cover molecular orbital theory next time. This is kind of a long chapter. It's got a lot in there. Um, okay, so if I could have all eyes on me just for a little while. Okay. All eyes on me, poor four. Are you paying attention? Sorry. Sorry. All right. Um, so we've been, we've done Lewis th theory. We've done Vesper theory. We have these Lewis we have these Lewis structures. We can determine the shapes of them. We can determine the polarity of them. Um, but what is the bonding model that explains those shapes? Okay, and that's what valence bond theory is all about. Okay, so molecular properties of um, molecules will affect reactivity. Okay, if, if a certain bond angle is a certain way, that might affect if it's reactive or not towards something else. Um, so when we're looking at various uh, effects of reactivity, various things that affect reactivity, bond lengths are one of them, right? And the longer a bond, the easier it is to break. Okay, so that's that's a factor that affects reactivity. Um, and this also affects the bond energy. Okay, so a longer bond means a weaker bond energy. Okay, um, dipole moments affect bond energies as well, um, and then molecular geometries, the shapes, affect these interactions. Um, so Lewis and Vesper theory only give what we call a qualitative treatment to approximate these numerical values. Okay, um, but what we're interested in is what is a bonding model that helps explain these bond energies and such. So for example, um, if I look at hydrogen sulfide, right, H2S, it's a molecule. Okay, this 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 uh, picture looks really weird, right? But what it is is that if you imagine a sulfur atom, what is the what is the electron configuration for sulfur? It's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p4, right? So if you imagine, here's a sulfur atom, okay, and it's got uh, here's two electrons. So sulfur has six valence electrons in it, right? So it's got here's two electrons, here's two more, and then here it's bonding with two hydrogen atoms, and one of these arrows belongs to, to sulfur for each of these bonds. So here's your two, three, four, six valence electrons in sulfur. How, how do the electrons pair up when they bond, okay, and how does this affect the shape? And that's what this part of the rest of this chapter is about. If you envision sulfur with its 3s2 electrons, the three s two electrons are in here, and then you've got these three p orbitals, each housing electrons. Okay, so three s two, three p four. That's the valence configuration for sulfur. Does sulfur bond with the hydrogen atoms with its three p electrons, or does it bond with its three s electrons? And you would think it's with through three p, right? Okay. So if you look at this picture, here's the three p x. Here's the 3PY, and this might be the 3PZ orbitals, right? Remember, going back to quantum numbers, negative 1, 0, and plus 1 are the possible orientations for any P orbital. And so the P orbitals are said to be 90 degrees apart from each other. Okay, and because the P orbitals are 90 degrees apart, you know, X, Y, Z axes, you would think that the bond angle between the H, the H S, and H would be exactly 90 degrees. You would think that. Does that make sense? So you would think that the bond angles should correspond to the atomic orbitals being used to bond. Okay. However, experiments have shown that the bond angle is not 90 degrees. It's actually a little bit off from 90. It's 92 degrees. Okay. And also Vesper, the Vesper model predicts that these bond angles would be something less than 109.5, but that's just a qualitative way of looking at it. So what bonding model can we use to explain the fact that it's not 90 degrees, but it's 92 degrees, right? Here's another example, and I think this is even um, an even better example. Uh, check out methane. Okay, methane is assumed, okay, that with Lewis and Vesper theory, it would assume that the C bonds of methane are not identical. Okay, so for example, carbon, what, what's the electron configuration of carbon? It's 2s2, 2p2, right, for its, for its valence shell. See, we think that if carbon is going to make four bonds, which orbitals is it bonding with? It's p orbitals or the s orbitals? 
Well, if you think, okay, I've got the 2p2, I can bond with two of the hydrogens with those 2p orbitals, uh, the 2p electrons, and then with the other two, uh, the 2s electrons in carbon, those are going to be used to bond with the hydrogen, the other two hydrogens. Right, so, car so methane is CH4, right? Carbon has four valence electrons, but two of them are from the S and two of them are from the P's. Okay, depending on what orbitals are used to bond, you think the bond energies are going to be different. Okay, however, they're all the same. All right, so, so two H atoms would bond with two P, uh, two H atoms would bond with two S electrons and carbon. Um, the 1s and 2s orbital overlap of the CH bonds would be shorter than that for the 1s and 2p. So this goes even a little further back. Which orbitals are closer to the nucleus? Are the p orbitals closer to the nucleus, or are the s orbitals closer to the nucleus? The s is, in a given shot, s is usually closer. So you would think that the bond energy for carbon bonding with its 2s, bonding to the 1s of a hydrogen, you would think that bond energy would be stronger <clears throat> because the electrons are closer to the nucleus. But here's the thing. Experiments have shown that all the CH bonds in methane are all the same. They're all identical in energy. They're all identical in length. Okay, so clearly we need some other bonding model to help explain the fact that all the bond energies are the same. All the bond angles in the methane molecule are all the same, right? Perfect tetrahedrons, 109.5, those are the bond angles in methane. Okay. So we have this bonding theory called valence bond theory that helps explain the shapes of the molecules using a new bonding model. Okay. So um, this applies to what we call a quantum mechanical approach to Lewis theory. <clears throat> um, the valence electrons of the atoms in any molecule reside in quantum mechanical atomic orbitals. Okay, however, the orbitals can be the standard SPD or F, or they may be hybrids of combinations of these. Okay, so when you think of the word hybrid, what do you think of? You think of, like, a hybrid vehicle, it's both electric and gas. You think of hybrid organisms, maybe. Both, you know, uh, you know some organisms are sort of hybrids of both, right? Um, so the, again, the whole point of this bonding model is to explain the shapes of molecules. Right? What bonding model can help explain the shapes? Because clearly, if you just look at the atomic orbitals by themselves, the bond angles don't match up. The bond energies don't match up. Okay, so okay, so this is only accomplished through hybridization of the inner atoms. Okay, so what is hybridization? Okay, so hybridization is the process of moving valence electrons from individual atomic orbitals and moving them into hybrid orbitals. Okay, the SPD and F orbitals all have different potential energies, but hybrid orbitals all have the same potential energy. Okay, and because of this, the hybrid orbitals are said to be degenerate. Okay, so degeneracy just refers to two orbitals with the same exact energy. So if I made a hybrid orbital, out of an S and a P, okay, I can <clears throat> I can get two hybrid orbitals out. So however many atomic orbitals I use to make hybrids, I get that many hybrid orbitals out of those atomics. So I, I have an S and a P, two atomic orbitals, I get two hybrid orbitals out. Clearly the P and the S are different orbitals, right? But when they become hybrids, they now become the same. Maybe they are different orientation, but they're all but they're, they're all the same. So this picture is a nice schematic of what is hybridization. It's taking individual atomic orbitals, and now we're going to say, well, okay, let's make them all the same so that all the bonds around methane, for example, can be the same. Okay. So the number of hybrid orbitals generated depends on the steered number about a central atom. Um, for outer atoms, hybrid orbitals can be used, but it's not necessary. Um, some textbooks will, will do this, but a lot won't. Your author does not hybridize outer atoms, which I'm really happy about because it's it's so not necessary. Okay, um, you only use atomic orbitals for outer atoms to show bond, right? But we use hybrid orbitals for central atoms. Okay, and so we're we're going to do something called matching the lobe to the steered number. Okay, so here's 
your full-on Vesper shard with valence bond theory added onto it. And all, all I want to point out with this is to notice how with each uh, electron geometry shape, you get that many lobes. Right? So here's the central atom. Here's the central atom. The central atom is going to have two lobes bonded to it, which matches the steric number of two. So you look at the steric number, and it matches the number of lobes you have on the central atom. So two, steric number two, two lobes. Steric number three, you know, trigonal planar, makes three lobes. But remember, so each lobe is a hybrid orbital. It's, it's a mixture of an S and a P. Um, for tetrahedrons, you get something called SP3 hybridization. Um, each lobe is a hybrid, and each hybrid is basically 75% P and 25% S. You know, it's, it's, it's a mixture of S and P orbitals. Um, now, for the higher order structures, you know, trigonal bipyramids and octahedrals, um, in order to make these hybrids, you have to incorporate some of the D, D, um, D orbitals. Okay, so um, steric number five, five lobes, steric number six, six lobes. Okay, so when you get to the high order structures, I would say you have a whole lot of lobes, you know, which is kind of like a whole lot of love from Led Zeppelin, but I call it a whole lot of lobes. All right, so again, music maybe brings true to the ear. Um, so what is, and this gets us to the question, what is a chemical bond? If I ask you, what is a chemical bond? What is it? Okay. Okay, it's two electrons being shared between two atoms, but what bonding is involved in that? Okay, and so um, when a chemical bond results, <clears throat> um, it happens when you get an atomic or hybrid orbitals overlapping. Imagine, you know, not just two balls of charge being shared between two nuclei, but now it's two wave functions being shared. Okay, and you have to have orbital overlap. You have to have constructive interference, okay, of these wave functions overlapping so that you have a bonding hybrid orbital. Okay. Um, only two electrons can be um, in a new bond. That's that's nothing new, right? Two, a bond that has two electrons. Um, the electrons must be spin paired. <clears throat> Chemical bonds are drawn by showing the overlap of these orbitals, right? The lobes overlap. Okay, so here's a picture. Here's the lobe. All right, we're going to overlap this lobe with some other orbital from the atom that's bonding to that central atom. Okay, so each lobe can either <clears throat> bond to another atom, or if the lobe isn't bonding, it will hold a lone pair. So here's what we call a valence bond sketch for carbon. Okay, so carbon, we're going to do, we're going to do the hybridization and then show the sketch. So here's carbon unhybridized. Normally carbon is 2s2, 2p2, right? Everyone's cool with this? Are you cool? Are you cool? You're cool just with this? Unhybridized carbon? Alright, this is just carbon, you know, unhybridized by itself. Alright, and this is we're gonna do it for methane, okay? So if we hybridize carbon, okay, methane is a steric number four. And steric number four always uses what we call sp3 hybridization. What it is, is that we're going to take these four electrons, and now we're going to hybridize them into four of the same exact orbital to bond. Okay, if, these all, if all four of these electrons are now the same degenerate energy, that means all these bonds are now going to be the same energy as well. Okay, so the hydrogen will bond with its 1s, and then the carbon will bond with its four sp3 hybrids. Okay. So, um, and then this is a two because it's uh, it's coming from the 2p and 2s electro, uh, atomic orbitals. Okay, so I, I mean, I would just say, just even ignore this two, you don't have to do that. <clears throat> okay, so this is an example where carbon is sp3 hybridized. So we're gonna take that picture from this chart and we're going to now draw methane with carbon in the center here with its three lobes, or I'm sorry, four lobes. Okay, because it has to make four bonds. And so this is what a valence bond sketch would look like to illustrate the bonding. Okay, so here's, here's carbon in the center. 
It's got four lobes because it's steered number four, and it's got the four hydrogens bonded to it. And each bond has two electrons. One electron is from carbon, one is from the hydrogen. So the, these electrons here, this arrow down and this arrow down, and one of these two arrows and one of these two arrows, the four electrons from carbon being used to bond originally came from a 2s and also a 2p sublevel. But because we hybridized the carbon um, atomic orbitals, now we just have lows that account for the bond angles that you would see at, at 109.5. Okay, if we didn't hybridize this carbon, it'd be really hard to draw a bonding picture of the orbitals overlapping. Because two of these electrons would be coming from a sphere of an S, while the others would be coming from a Px and a Py or something like that. That's really hard to draw. Okay, and it doesn't account for the shape or the degenerate bond energies uh, of the CH bonds in methane. All right, it doesn't account for that. So we have to hybridize in order to have bonding that matches the shape of the Vesper sketch. And that's the whole point of valence bond theory. All right, this always sounds esoteric when you first hear it. Okay, and I'll explain it a thousand times over, hopefully in a thousand different ways till it clicks. But but basically, you have a central atom. Carbon, in this case, has a 2s and 2p sublevels for its valence. But using those does not account for the bond energies or bond angles of methane. Okay? But doing this hybridization, let me go back to this picture right here. Okay, doing a hybrid of these and making four of these allows us to do that bonding picture of methane you just saw. Alright, so unless I do this, I, I can't draw a picture using two of these and, and showing the hydrogens, right? Does hydrogen bond to this one or does hydrogen bond to that? All right, I'll get two different bonds when I do that. But I know with methane, they're all the same bonds. They're all exactly the same bond energy and, and length, okay? So I have to do hybridization in order to get these so that I can bond so that I can bond this way. Do you see any S orbital here? No. Do you see any P orbital here? No. All you see are four lows. Okay, we had we had to hybridize those two S and two P electrons to make them into these lows. So the process of hybridization is just taking the individual atomic orbitals and making them into lobes. That's hybridization. Okay, and then we can make these bond angles happen according to a bonding, bonding model. If I did ammonia, this would be ammonia. Okay, ammonia, uh, you might remember the Lewis structure for ammonia. It's NH3, it's got three bonded hydrogens and a lone pair of the nitrogen. That probably sounds familiar. Here's an SP3, uh, it's still steered number four. Right? Um, three bonded atoms, one, one lone pair. But now it's a trigonal pyramid shape, and it's got that one lone pair, you know, in that structure. And now the lone pair occupies one of those lobes. All right, so it looks very much like methane, but one lobe is now being used to house a lone pair. All right? This is called a non-bonding hybrid orbital. It's not, it's not bonding anything else. It's just used to house the lone pairs. Um, the outer atoms, you don't need to hybridize those. Okay, so hydrogen, it just, it's just going to bond with this 1s. Right? There's no shape around those hydrogens, so we're not going to bother hybridizing. So when we hybridize, or when we, when we draw these valence bond sketches, there's two kinds of bonds. We have what we call sigma bonds, and we have what we call pi bonds. Okay, pi bonds are only used if we have a double or triple bond. Okay, uh, if we don't have any double, double or triple bonds, they're always called sigma bonds. The difference is that with sigma bonds, sigma bonds are made using hybrid orbitals, but the double and triple bonds are not made using hybrid orbitals. Okay, um, sigma bonds are made using hybrids, and the bonding is always in between, directly in between the two atoms that are bonded. 
And because of this, sigma bonds are typically a lot stronger than pi bonds. Uh, pi bonds, on the other hand, are done by using orbital overlap side by side of p orbitals. All right, I'll try to illustrate that. The p orbitals are unhybridized. Okay, so um, sigma bonds are always stronger than pi bonds. Okay, so here's a here's a, a computerized rendition of a pi bond versus a sigma bond. So if I took two unhybridized p orbitals to make a double bond, you know, here are the atoms residing here. The electrons initially for the sigma bond are going to be inside, and then afterwards we have a double bond on the outside, right? If you're going to have a double bond. The electron density can't be where the original single bond was. Right? You have to have the electrons move to the outside because of just spatial con constrictions. Okay, but if you have a um, two p orbitals overlapping side by uh, or I'm sorry, end to end, you get a, a sigma bond. So this picture here would be an example of two uh, two sp hybrid orbitals um, overlapping, or two, or two sp hybridized atoms overlapping. Which one offers more overlap? Is it this or is it that? Okay, because right now, like if I were to draw on paper, here's a um, here's a p orbital. There's not much overlap there, right? Here, here's, say, for example, two carbon atoms, right? And they're bonding with a double bond, right? And then here's here's a carbon bonding within each other. Right? There's more overlap here. More overlap versus. Versus that. Now, if I wanted to try and superimpose this bond on top of this sigma bond, I would try to do something like like that, maybe. But it's really hard to draw like that. So this is like by hand. Actually, connect down here as well. Okay, that's really hard to do. So I have to show you the computerized drawing. So if you look at two p orbitals kind of overlapping like down here and up there, you get this kind of deal. But that's a weaker interaction. That's a weaker overlap than a sigma bond. And that's because sigma bond, or, or that's why sigma bonds are a lot stronger. Okay. 